Hi, this is Jay Billis of ESPN, and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. The ML Sports Platter is back with you all over the major platforms. Go ahead and download, subscribe, leave feedback, and a five-star review. We are brought to you by Axe Exotic Pets, Route 11 Cicero. If you're in and around central New York, go get those special exotic pets, all the accessories. They've got uh, uh, tanks uh, and aquariums, uh, incredible stuff over there at Axe Exotic Pets, everything you need for your exotic pet. And also, they've got snakes, they have birds, they have turtles, they've got specialty uh, 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 items across the board for all of your uh, exotic pet needs over there at Axe Exotic Pets. Make sure you go stop and see Carl and the staff and visit them on Facebook for more information as well. Thanks to Liverpool Physical Therapy, Bryant and Stratton College, Sit Mean Sit Syracuse, and our good buddies over at the Syracuse Fitness Store. Go get your workout equipment today. Exercise bikes, stair masters, you name it, free weights, exercise mats, Syracuse Fitness Store on Erie Boulevard if you're in and around Central New York. Well, I can't wait to chat with uh, the next guest of the ML Sports Platter. Uh, through the years, has been a very successful punter in the NFL. He's still looking for a job out there. If you're an NFL GM and you're somehow listening to the ML Sports Platter, go hire the veteran, Dustin Colquitt. He is a Super Bowl champion, of course. Uh, he's played with the Chiefs, the Steelers, the Bucks, Jaguars, and uh, is a two-time Pro Bowler and uh, was actually a two-time first-team All-SEC man and a consensus All-American back in 2003 and 2004 and went to Tennessee for his college football. Dustin Colquitt, the Super Bowl champion. Hey, bud, how are you? And uh, thanks for a few minutes. It is. Doing great this morning. How's everything up in the Northeast? Fine here. Um, and, And your status right now is you're looking, you still want to kick, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm still... uh... You know, staying in shape, uh, kicking, doing everything I can to kind of get ready for the season, and uh, just trying to see what the uh, you know one less preseason game, and obviously you know for the first time in NFL history, a seventeenth regular season game. This Chiefs team right now, they're kind of you know almost in the middle of what could be you know almost a dynasty type run here. Definitely, and I, and I think, you know, in New England, when they uh, made the pass the baton to Brady through that uh, Bledsoe injury, you know, I didn't think they thought, hey, this is going to the start of a dynasty. Um, I think that Kansas City, uh, through John Dorsey, took a big chance on a very talented kid out of Lubbock and uh, knew that his family pedigree was – very strong and you know you got to start somewhere and the Chiefs hadn't done that since 1982 and just took a uh, what looked like to be a, a risk in the organization that Clark Hunt is definitely known for for taking I mean it's, it's been the wild west since Clark took over in 2006 for uh, his father Lamar which was an unbelievable man and a humanitarian philanthropist there's no, no bad things part of the original Foolish Club. Um, and, and when Andy Reid came to town, uh, the landscape drastically changed from small market team to winning nine games in a row uh, for the first time since 2003 when Trent Green and Dick Vermeil uh, did that. And we went from a, hey, you know, we're going to try to knock off the San Diego Chargers, you know, at the time with Ladanian Tomlinson and Schottenheimer to – um, hey, we're we're going to compete for championships a little bit sooner than we thought. Um, and so when you have a, a a change like that that happens so quickly, um, you know, obviously, you know, Andy, he doesn't know anything but winning here. His yeah. winning percentage speaks for itself. And the culture that uh, he and Dorsey, you know, quickly turned over a roster uh, now with uh, Brett Beach learning in the wings, you know, how to do this pl- from a player personnel standpoint. It's been fun to watch, you know, some of the players that we've not only gotten in the draft, but through free agency, it's become a free agent destination for the first time when I was there of people, hey, we want to play in Kansas City. Yeah, no doubt about it. So, so when you win a Super Bowl and, 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 and the clock hits zero, I mean, what's, What's going through your body? What's it feel like? It's, you know, it was, I think, I, I, 
and I've said this before, but the AFC Championship game to me was more of a euphoric, out of body experience than the Super Bowl because of how much we kind of talked about it. The the owner, his name, you know, you know, rides that the the trophy. It's the Lamar Hunt Trophy for the AFC Championship. Um, and so to do that on home soil and in that stadium for the first time ever was just kind of a unique experience to see the family. I've watched, you know, all those kids grow up um, since I've been there since 2005. So I, you know, I saw some of them in diapers and <laughs> got to see, you know, their faces and just the organization saying, hey, we finally got this. And then so then the, obviously then the Super Bowl becomes a reality. We're either going to take the, you know, the, the redheaded stepchild ring or we're going to win a Super Bowl. And so it kind of became a, a reality. And then as you see that the playoff build has come back from 24 points, 10 points, you know, all these deficits, you realize that, you know, and so, and, unless we get blown out, you know, this is going to be, even if we're down, the ball is still in our court. And that's exactly what happened. Talking with Dustin Colquitt, the uh, NFL punter, of course, uh, wishing him uh, the best of luck to try and uh, land somewhere here for the upcoming 2021 20, season, a Super Bowl champion, and uh, spent some time with the Chiefs, Steelers, Bucks, and Jags. Um, what makes a great punter? Uh, I think a guy that is willing to turn something to from a hobby into a craft. Um, the, the great punters that I knew were, you know, usually good at something. If I watched guys on film, like your Leckler, Cypress, uh, Jeff Fiegels is obviously the big hero. Um, and then I, I picked uh, a lot of things out of people's books as I've watched them going good. Or if I saw a guy go on a streak like Sam Cook, and Brett Kern, Johnny Hecker, I mean, these guys, um, even my brother has, has changed some of the rules. And I watch, watch them a lot in his holding stuff. So I just tried to pick and choose, you know, it's like a la carte. You just try to watch these guys. You've got the gift of film. Eye in the sky doesn't lie. And so when you're watching these guys do their best, I think the hardest part that when I, when I was going through trying to learn from everybody is to try to make it your craft. And, you know, if you're going to be a nerd at anything, let's do something that puts food on the table for your family and, you know, set you up to get into schools and churches and talk to, to the kids and then you become an influencer I'm going to try to be the best I can about it. So I'd watch Shane and Mike Cyphers in the mirror backwards because they're right footed. And I wanted to see what it looked like coming from a lefty because I'm a lefty. So I would watch film uh, just like a offensive coordinator, or defensive coordinator, or quality control guy, knowing that, you know, if I, if I, you know, scrape these guys down and can watch the best of the best at either foot, if I have to watch it backwards in a mirror, then I'm going to do that. Um, so that's, what I always try to focus on is, is I wanted that guy after the game, not only just to say like, Hey, good game, good, you know, good hitting the ball, but just like, it's so much fun pulling the tape up on Monday and watching you play. And I, you know, I've, I've heard that a lot, but I've also said that to a lot of guys because it is fun. You know, that's the best part about after a Sunday game or Thursday night or Monday night is that next game that next day opening up your iPad and getting to watch that guy and being able to say, all right, now I can watch somebody that's doing, doing it the best in the world right now and try to do it yourself. I just have a couple more for you, Dustin. And, and you went to Tennessee, which is, you know, SEC, it's, 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 it's a religion. Football is, people are just nuts about it, uh, uh, constant. I mean, every day of the year, off-season, in-season, uh, and, and you've got, you know, a stadium that's 100 and whatever thousand people, right? 15, 20,000 people. And every Saturday is the biggest thing ever. Did, did it help you when you got into the NFL when you saw a crowd of 75,000? You just walk out, you're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know, because the SEC, right? It's just, I mean, that's where it's at. And so it's almost like a mini pro league. You go into the NFL, and I, I got to believe the transition from that standpoint in terms of the atmosphere, the crowd, the pressure. I got to believe it would be a little smoother coming from the SEC. It, 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 so it is. And it, it, it prepares you a lot just being in Tennessee. And it was kind of 13th grade for me just because I never left home. And go to somebody like Philip Fulmer and uh, General Nealon that, 
you know, had all these maxims. I mean, one of his maxims reads out, protect our kickers, our and out of the seven maxims that they do on a daily basis, four of them have something about the kicking game. Press the kicking game here where the breaks are made. And that's very true. The, the game of hidden yardage, the, the stall drive that a kicker hits a long field goal or somebody that can hang a kickoff to the goal line, get those guys that are covering that kickoff and get a guy inside the 15-yard line is – is massive when it comes to the scoring percentage as the offense tries to get the ball back down the field. So that emphasis on that kicking game when I grew up in Tennessee was, you know, the same. Palmer was – his practices were super high pressure. He wanted you prepared for everything. You get into a game in Tennessee, and it was, you know, 109,000 when I was there. We had, I think we had an, we had an aging um, fan base. Put some chairs for a lot of those folks. Um, so now it's 103, which I'm kidding a little bit, but, uh, you, you, you know what I mean? They, they liked their Tennessee football and uh, it was loud. You go to, you know, your Florida, never got a chance to play in death Valley with LSU, but go to Alabama, Georgia, um, South Carolina, oh. Starkville's a tough place to play with the, uh, the bells, Arkansas. It's always bad, you know, typically bad weather when we played there. And so all these places, just gets you in that playoff mode already. So you go to Kansas City. I remember my first game ever was in the Dome in Minnesota. We had a defensive line, uh, lineman. We took a timeout, a long field goal, expiring clock, and the defensive lineman's yelling at me, Colquitt, hey, Colquitt, you're going to choke. You know, you know, you, you know, you ever played in front of this many people before? And I looked, it was a timeout. So I said, I was a rookie, but I was like, this needs to stop or my kicker is going to be distracted. So I said, I was like, hey, you know, Tennessee has 109,000 people. I don't know if there's 9,000 people in here for this preseason game. And so he immediately kind of looks and thinks about it, and looks over at Lawrence Tynes like, hey, Lawrence, how many people play at Troy State? You know, how, how many people are Troy? You know, you're, you're, you, you ready for this kind of deal? And so I think that that uh, definitely got us ready at the SEC. And then you go to Arrowhead the first two games my rookie year and you're like man this is like the sec all over again and some and that was that was amazing and then you go to a the next play you know you can go to st louis when the card uh, uh, rams were there and there's certain places where there it's just not up to that level uh for whatever reason indoors or you know their record or whatever it was but arrowhead is, is so much like that it's always a playoff atmosphere and that's just a big um, and, and you know they love the barbecue. They love the atmosphere. And you know Kansas City's lucky to have them. What's happened to that Tennessee program, Dustin? You know, like wh what happened? Where did it go wrong here? Is it a recruiting thing? For in Tennessee. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, when you have turnover like that, you have a massive shift in. Uh, you know, L LSU and Alabama, it seems like, and your Georgias, and you just have you, you miss one time on a you know I, I don't like, like bringing up names, so I probably won't do that. But um, you have a head coach that comes in and does not have does not sign an offensive lineman during his first year as a head coach, and then he's converting offensive linemen to defensive linemen, and I think it's just a slippery slope that the brakes fall off and it only takes one year to really cloud out the fan base. And, uh, I, I know that Butch, Butch Jones also had a little, you know, bad luck. He'd have like the, you know, really fast starts. And then, you know, they just get in that Alabama, Georgia, you know, South Carolina, whoever it is, whoever we're playing, it just seems like we could not get those big sec wins that we needed for not only for our record and for, for bowl season, uh, to get into SEC championship games, but you know, also for that for that re the recruits to look around and say, "Hey, you know, I don't know if the ship's going in the right direction for me to jump on." Um, the stern's too stiff for for me to turn it in the right direction. I think we have a little bit of little bit of that going on uh, right now. I think we have good recruits. I I, I do question uh, the past four or five years. You know from an offensive coordinating position and it's also personnel. And so when you don't have the personnel, it's hard to 
know, trust, hey, we're going to you know, put these kids into this uh, situation. So uh, I'm hope, hopeful that we get on the right track. I know that uh, the donors are, are, are there. We're, we're backed. I'm part of that. And so I know that the, the, the giving certainly hasn't stopped. We just got to try to figure out how to, you know, uh, for lack of better words, steal some of these players that used to, that we used to get out of California and Florida, you know, in Tennessee, you know, we, we've, we've passed over starting with Randall Cobb, uh, you know, guys that are literally in our backyard looking over a fence at Neyland stadium and saying like, Hey, why aren't we grabbing these guys? Um, we gotta, we gotta have more guys like on the ground recruiting. So, um, I think that that's starting to, to shift and, you know the relevance and importance of the, the, the recruiting trail, and, and I think our guys are they're, they're young enough that they're still hitting it hard now, and hopefully we have a turn on that because it's, it's been hard to watch really for the past 15 years, except for a couple seasons. Uh, you know, Lane was uh, had some electric energy when he came in. Uh, got to do the game maxims before a game there against South Carolina, and he said it's going to you know he came in very militaristic, and all the players are in there and all the coaches come from different doorways right with one minute to go right before they take the field i just in the game maxims and he comes in and he's like hey it's going to be wet i want you guys putting a helmet on the ball we're going to get three turnovers here and we got to be popping balls out that's the main uh, you know that, that's the influence i want our defense to have on the game tonight i couldn't believe it we had three turnovers popping balls out in the first half and so it's funny when somebody Breeze life into a team like that. I know that it didn't work out long term for him, but we got to get somebody in there like him that's super creative, that has a, a, a great tight end, that isn't just stuffing the ball up in the A gaps, that, that really uh, brings that uh, creativity and cleverness to the offensive must in the, in the, in the, in the um, SEC now. I mean, it's a super conference. You're seeing, you know, a shift where they're, 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 kind of seeing eye to eye with the NCAA a little bit and saying, Hey, this is what we got. So Tennessee has got to make sure they're looking around. We've been able to do that in baseball now, which is fun to see in Omaha and it work out for us. But on all levels, Tennessee sports are really elevating. We just have to get that, uh, the cash cow, you know, back in the driver's seat, which I'm, I'm hope, hopefully we're doing, making moves to do that now. All right. Final thing, maybe in, in, in a minute or so, and I can't thank you enough for coming on. This has been fun. Um, the Buffalo Bills are, are a team that, you know, they're like a lot of others. They're chasing the Chiefs. Um, what, is, what has impressed you the most with the Bills kind of, you know, with this turnaround under Sean McDermott, Brandon Bean? You know, you can kind of see teams coming on in the league, right? So what, what have you seen from afar uh, with this Buffalo Bills franchise? Yeah, definitely. And it's, I think it's one of those uh, things where it's like I spoke of earlier with Kansas City. It's becoming a free agency destination. Guys that they've been able to coax away from a team where they may be comfortable with or love the city to say, hey, we're Allen's throwing the ball just about as good as anybody in the league right now. And I believe that, you know, when you have free agents that want to be at a destination, uh, very important stuff, tackles, you have a uh, highest paid center in the game, my, per- my buddy, with uh, Mitch Morse, um, you have guys that want to be in Buffalo, that want to push for a championship, and they're right on the doorstep. They're they're knocking, as a matter of fact. And, and I think that goes back to a culture that McDermott, you know, he he sets forth, and, and guys jump on and follow and say like, this is not only where we want to be, we want to live, we want to set roots. If you talk to any players in Buffalo, um, that's what they'll tell you. They say, you know, Buffalo is one of those. Uh, neighborhoods that you can raise your kids, live there for the rest of your life. I think Jim Kelly uh, set out on that track. and A lot of those uh, uh, guys that had played there of old, and uh, now they're getting those players back that they're looking, they're saying, like, look, I don't I don't need all the dollars out here in free agency. I just want to come and play. You, know, you have five, six guys that decide, hey, Buffalo's where I want to be because they're playing great football right now. And that's been the difference for Kansas City as well. Dustin Colquitt, the longtime punter in the NFL, a Super Bowl champ with the Chiefs. Uh, Dustin, thank you so much for the time. Good luck to you. Hope you find a home, and hopefully we can do this again soon.
Absolutely. Be in touch. Appreciate the time. I really hope Dustin Colquitt finds a gig in 2021. The veteran, 39 years old and a Super Bowl champ, but just really one of the great guys in football uh, across the board. The ML Sports Platter is brought to you by our great friends over at Welch and Company Jewelers and the Allen Angus Pub. They're going to be closed through Labor Day, but make sure you follow them on uh, Facebook and Twitter for more and more updates. Uh, right after Labor Day, they'll be right back open, so grab the best darn Angus burger in town. Tip of the cap, thank you as well to Bryant and Stratton College, the great folks over at Barks and Rec Doggy Daycare, and Prestwick Golf. If you need your golf clubs regripped in, in and around Central New York, make sure that you do indeed go to Prestwick Golf. Ed and his team have uh, a ton of new and used clubs as well, and uh, he can help you out uh, with, with the grips. I get them done every single year. It's pretty great over there at Prestwick Golf Course Court Street in Central New York. Prestwick Golf is the official golf regrip company of the ML Sports Platter. Let's bring in Marty Appel, the terrific longtime baseball author and historian, the former mailman for Mickey Mantle way back in the day, the first PR director in Yankees history, hired by George Steinbrenner, of course, and he's uh, got all of his work at AppelPR.com. That's A-P-P-E-L-P-R.com. You probably have seen him uh, on TV during the Yankeeographies and, 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 and read a lot of his great stuff, Section 420, Talking Yankees, and uh, you can listen into a, a lot of his work uh, as well uh, with uh, you know on WFAN, on, on with Michael Kay. He's everywhere. He's been everywhere. He's a true Yankee historian. And uh, let's bring Marty in right now. Marty, thank you so much, man. Mike, so good to talk to you as always. I'm well and hope the same for you. Things are great. Appreciate you asking. And uh, obviously some news, right, with Pinstripe Empire. It's been updated through the 2020 season on the Kindle ebook. That's pretty, uh, that's pretty uh, exciting. I was very happy about that, Mike. This is a book that first came out in 2012. And Pinstripe Empire was designed to be the whole history of the Yankees back to their very beginnings in 1903. And with a lot of work and a lot of interviews and finding long-lost anecdotes, uh, we were able to put together what was has come to be seen as the definitive history of the club. And it was updated in soft cover a few years later. And now the publisher agreed to keep it in print, keep it going through the 2020 season, at least with the ebook version. So I would have preferred, you know, a new hardcover version or something, but it's going to take a World Series victory, I think, to get them to do that. But of course, so much happens in Yankee Land, and this update has the Rivera and Jeter retirements, the A Rod nonsense, and. <laughs> the arrival of Aaron Judge and so forth. So uh, I was delighted to have the chance to keep it updated and fresh, and it's available on ebook. That's awesome. Um, what do you think about this team here? You know, they went on that big, long uh, winning streak, and they're leading the first wild card. It's, it's going to be tough to catch the Rays, obviously. That team right now is just a juggernaut. Um, but but Yankees, do they make the playoffs? What, 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 what kind of chances do you think they have in October, Marty? Well... You know, I was delighted with the, uh, as a fan, I was delighted with the 13-game winning streak. But then you say, well, do we want this team to peak in August, or do we want this team to peak a little later on? Uh, the first half of the season brought so much frustration, and my gosh, people on social media calling for Boone and Cashman to get fired, and uh, this has been a topsy-turvy year, no doubt. And I still have never personally adjusted to all the strikeouts. My gosh, it's just, I hate baseball this way with so many strikeouts. So I can't predict. I mean, as easily as they won the 13 straight, they could. there was a precedent. Um, the Yankees has once won, uh, I think, 19 in a row and then lost 10 in a row. And that was when they were really you know, first-rate quality Hall of Fame laden team. So I'm not, I'm certainly not one who's going to make any predictions now. I just kind of wish they peaked later than in the middle of August. No doubt. I, I know you went on, uh, I think it was almost a year ago here with, with Sweeney Murdy on WFAN, and you had told a story 
uh, about trying to get Tom Seaver to be a broadcaster for the Yankees. Can, can you enlighten my listeners into that, Marty? Yeah, I mean, I don't remember exactly what I talked about with Sweeney, but when we lost Bill White from the broadcast booth to become National League president, um, I was the executive producer of the telecast at the time on WPIX, and we needed a replacement. And there were a lot of good candidates. Um, We also interviewed 15 or 20. A lot of them flew into New York to meet with us at their own expense, and Everybody wants the Yankee job. And then I got a phone call from Tom Seaver's agent, Matt Marola, who said that Tom would be interested. Well, I was always a Tom Seaver fan, even though I was working for the Yankees. So admired him and his um, his work ethic. And he had done national broadcasting for NBC, which I thought was very impressive. So I said, well, let's meet with Tom. Let's see. And that went well, and he didn't really need an audition tape because we were familiar with his work at NBC. And so we hired Tom uh, to replace Bill White, and I think he did five seasons. And the truth was, and I'm very honest when I say this, I'm not sure Yankee fans ever really embraced Tom Seaver being in the Yankee booth or loved his work. Um, The higher-ups at WPIX loved the glamour of his name and the fact that we were able to sign such a big star. But I think Yankee fans never quite warmed up to Tom Seaver as a Yankee. So that's just my feeling retrospectively. But I liked his work, and I'm proud of that hire because it was for the right reasons. It was the quality of his broadcasting. But it's just my feeling now, all these years later, that it really didn't go over all that well with Yankee fans. The longtime baseball author and historian Marty Appel, appelpr.com. Go check it out. Grab his books, Pinstripe Empire, of course, and uh, uh, the awesome biographies on Thurman Munson and Casey Stengel, among others. Um Derek Jeter next Wednesday. I'm heading down. They're finally doing the induction uh, for the 2020 class. Good for you. I can't wait. I'm credentialed. I'm going to try to get a ton of interviews, and it's just going to be a special day because he's my favorite player of all time. Um, what What do you remember about his career the most? You know, it's a strange memory for me of his career. He was not the kind of a guy that when he went to bat, you were thinking home run. And yet, he delivered so many clutch home runs. He's in the top 10 all-time of Yankee home run hitters. He's number three all-time of postseason home runs. And you just look at those numbers with amazement because, as I say, when he came to bat, you weren't thinking home run. And yet, he came through so often. And then there's all those great highlight reel plays like diving into the stands or the flip against Oakland in the playoffs. And uh, this, uh, he never said anything wrong. He handled himself so well for so many years with New York media. And I just have nothing but great admiration for him. You know, he, he's kind of like he's kind of like my DiMaggio, you know, or my Mantle, you know, he's kind of like that. Absolutely. The Yankees, of course, historically have always had the guy. Ruth, Gehrig, DiMaggio, Mantle, Mercer, Munson, Mattingly, Jeter, Judge. I mean, it's just, the lineage is spectacular. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. Marty, final question for you um, on, on, on Jeter. Um do, do you think he stays in baseball for a while as an executive? We know that he's you know, when he commits to something, he's he's he gets after it. Could can you see him in the game for a long time at that high level? I can't get in his mind. I don't know how much he's enjoying it. Um, somebody could come along and offer offer his group so much money to buy that team that it becomes irresistible for him to say, "Let's cash out and let's make all these billions." But um, as far as I know, you're right. I mean, his work ethic is such that he'll stay with it and stay with it and nurture it back to uh, contention. 
AppelPR.com is a website. Go check it out. Baseball author and historian Marty Appel. So great to catch up with you here again, Marty. Congrats on having Pinstripe Empire extended through 2020 uh, on that Kindle. That is uh, somewhere that people should go and uh, check out the book. It's the definitive history of the New York Yankees. Marty, you've been great to me over the years, man. Hopefully when I'm in the Big Apple, I'll uh, be able to grab a bite, at, bite to eat with you and uh, enjoy the rest of your summer. You too, and thank you as always, Mike. Big time thanks to Dustin Colquitt and Marty Appel here on the ML Sports Platter. We are brought to you by Brian Conboy of Mass Mutual New York State, Sit Mean Sit Syracuse, and Bryant and Stratton College. Two and four-year degrees are always starting at Bryant and Stratton College. Go visit them at bryantstratton.edu. Great time now to be a Bobcat. And a big time thanks to title sponsor Stanley Law Offices. Together, they'll work to get you the maximum award. For more, visit stanleylawoffices.com. And don't forget, in conjunction with Stanley Law Offices, is music for the mission. Every dollar provides a meal for the homeless uh, in Syracuse, uh, New York. So make sure that you go to Music for the Mission and the Facebook page and all the websites and social. Donate just a few bucks and it will go a ton uh, it will go a long way uh, for those who need our help. Hit me on Twitter, at Mike L Sports. As I always tell you, enjoy the games.